Well, what a wonderful way to start our time together, singing the praises of our great God. Hello and welcome to another week of Sundays Online. My name's Simon, I'm a ministry apprentice here at Christchurch. This week, like every week, we'll be spending time hearing from God's Word, uh, singing again and praying together as we all gather in our own homes to do church together. Today, we move on to the second book in our two book series on Habakkuk and Haggai, the book of Haggai. Our senior minister, Nigel Fortescue, will be spending a moment to orientate us to this uh, new book uh, before opening up chapter one and really getting stuck into the challenges that we find there. We'll also be taking some time to hear from our kids and youth ministers, Josh and Lauren, as they share about how the kids and youth ministries are going, the challenges of going through this COVID time uh, and what they're up to at the moment. But before we get stuck into everything else happening this morning, what better way to start our time than by praying? So please join me in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. God's people, the Israelites, were captured by the Babylonians, who destroyed God's temple, taking its treasures and people back to the nation of Babylon. God's people spent 70 years in a land that wasn't their own, but God was with them. God kept his promises, and finally, they were allowed to return to Jerusalem. Once they returned to Jerusalem, they got to work rebuilding the city, but very soon they were occupied with building their own houses. Mm, isn't your house awesome? My but house look at my panels. Cool. They're not as good as mine. I got green panels. I got red panels. Okay. Well, I have a train station on the top of my house as well. What? So I, got, I got a tree and a, and a lake. Well, you know what you don't have? You don't have a slippery dip. So that's really unfortunate. That is pretty unfortunate. I got Dora the Explorer though. Oh, wow. So the Lord Almighty sent a prophet, his messenger Haggai. What are you guys doing? This is what God says. My temple is destroyed, but you are living in your houses that have beautiful wooden walls. Think carefully about how you are living. You expected a lot. But you can see that what a small amount it turned out to be. I blew away what you brought home and I'll tell you why, announces God who rules over all. Because my temple is still destroyed. But in spite of that, each of you is busy building your own house. What are you doing, Israel? You're building your own house while God's temple is destroyed. God's house is destroyed. God's message was for his people to give careful thought to what they were doing. God's people were not putting God first. They were not loving him with everything and it showed by their choices. They were building their own houses while God's temple was a ruin. Zerubbabel, the governor, and Joshua, the high priest, and all the people in the land had a choice. Would they listen and obey God or would they ignore him and live their own way? I wonder which way they would go. We will listen and obey God. We will stop building our houses and we will build God's house. So God was with them. They stopped work on their own houses and started work rebuilding the Lord's temple, which was a really excellent thing for them to do. This part of the Bible shows us that God's people were not putting God first. They were not loving him with everything and it showed by their choices. When God pointed this out through the prophet Haggai, they changed their ways and put God first. Those who trust in Jesus are the people of God. And we know that Jesus is truly spectacular. He's completely awesome and totally splendid. And therefore, Jesus deserves to be the most important thing in our life. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. However, sometimes we choose to love other things more than him. 
And this can look like little choices we make each day which show our priorities or our preference. It could look like we choose to watch TV instead of reading the Bible, or we fight and hurt others in our family rather than loving them. We play sport or go shopping on the weekend instead of watching church online with our church friends, or we keep the good news of Jesus to ourselves instead of sharing it with our friends. Today, we need to stop and pay careful attention to our ways. Are you choosing to put Jesus first in your life? Do you love him with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and with all your strength? Who could you help today to help put Jesus first in their life? Today for our craft, we're going to build a temple. So get out your Lego, your Duplo, your blocks, anything you've got, or you could make it with paper. And you're gonna build a temple, a really big temple, like the one in our story today. Well, now we have an opportunity for you to check in, for you to let us know that you're here, to let us know prayer points. Um, this is a great time also for you to grab a Bible if you haven't got one ready already, uh, and we'll come back uh, and Nigel will introduce the book of Haggai for us. Hi, I'm Lauren and this is Josh. Hello. And we're part of the Kids, Youth and Families team here at Christchurch. And today we're just gonna give you a brief update about what's been happening in the kids and youth space. Mm. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Don't keep them away. God's kingdom belongs to people like them. God has been at work in young people at Christchurch for many, many years. And we're pleased to say that he is still at work building wholehearted disciples of Christ out of our young people, out of our children, and out of our youth. Um, and so, yeah, we just wanted to share some of the things that have been happening. Um, Lauren, what's been the hardest thing about kids and youth ministry over the last six months? I guess the biggest thing is that we just don't get to see the children as much as we used to. And so leaders have been separated from teaching and kids have been separated from the friendships um, they have at church. And Josh, what's the hardest thing about youth ministry in the last six months? It's just been, it's just been the same. Um, not being able to see people has been so tiring and, and just emotionally really, really hard for me and for leaders and for our young people. And it's just been a bit strange sort of having to do everything on Zoom or go to meeting um, and not having that face to face relationships that we've been created for which has been sad yeah. but there is exciting news Lauren because we've been able to do a few things in person recently haven't we yep definitely yeah. what um, have been some highlights so the kids uh, the big kids have been reading the best news ever Whoa. which is a hundred day Bible reading challenge through the book of Mark and we've just seen kids really embrace reading the Bible and learning about Jesus uh, kids that have come to church forever have said things like I just didn't know that I didn't know so much about Jesus. And so they've been really curious and been reading with their families and sharing the, the good news with their friends. Um, so that's been a real highlight. And the second highlight in kids is that we've been back to the building for two really cool things. Kids space on a Friday afternoon, which we're just loving. Mm. And um, in the school holidays, we had a fireside event where the same kids came, brought friends and were able to reconnect in friendship with each other and learn about Jesus together. So good. Yep. And so Josh, what's been some good things that have happened in youth? Yeah. So we were able to have a big event at church uh, with 150 kids and youth 
uh, 150 youth and their leaders the week before the 100 person limit was brought in. So we spent a lot of time looking at God being in control and good and loving in the midst of suffering. And that was really, really special in helping us think through how to live as a Christian in, when the world is so hard at the moment. And we've been back in person for junior high and senior high uh, the last few weeks this term, which has been so, so good. We're very thankful for that. Um, Lauren, what are some ways that people can be supporting kids and youth uh, in prayer? Well, I guess the big thing is that kids will keep growing in their faith and so that they'll persevere even through a pandemic and they'll bring their worries about COVID to God. And so you can pray that kids will do that and that they'll be sharing the good news wherever they go. Thank you. Hi there, my name's Bea and I attend the nine o'clock congregation with my family. Today I'm going to be praying for us. I'm going to be praying for the kids and youth ministry at our church, for scripture in schools, for teachers, and finally for those of us who live far away from our families and may be feeling a bit lonely at the moment. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, you are worthy of all praise. You are faithful and have a good plan. You are the same yesterday as you are today, and you always will be. It's hard for us to understand your plan for the world, but we pray that you would help us to rely on you and always put our trust in you. Lord, we want to give you thanks that scripture classes and kids space have resumed so that kids can learn more about the love God has for them. Our children and teens have been so affected by COVID and we thank you for their strength as they try to navigate their lives during this pandemic. We pray that our kids will come, keep coming to you with their worries around COVID and receive comfort that can only be found in Jesus. God, we thank you that our youth have been able to meet in person in growth groups and in services. We pray that their fellowship and faith will continue to grow as they hear your word together. We also pray that the Youth Mission Weeks will bear much fruit, that friends will be invited and that they might hear the gospel message of Jesus. We pray for the school teachers, early childhood educators and uni lecturers at the moment as they try to teach during this difficult time and figure out the best way forward for their students. We pray practically that you might keep them and their students healthy and well but also that they would find support, they would support each other while things are so different. Finally, Lord, we want to uplift those people who are far away from family and longing to see them again. It's been easy to take for granted that we can travel so freely to see friends and family, but now that's much more complex. Many of us have family living in different states or overseas. Please provide those people with your ultimate comfort, knowing that you are a God who cares deeply for his people and that we can turn to you when we are lonely. Please give us wisdom in how we care for one another when we can't always be there physically and to provide practical support for each other as a community. We bring all of these things before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I hope you have been enjoying our Life in the Kingdom's Light series, looking at Habakkuk and starting today, Haggai. Uh, these two little prophets have a big message about the Kingdom of God spoken to the people of God on either side of a massive national trauma. So they both have helpful words for us who are in the midst of an international trauma. But before we have our Bible reading and launch into the sermon, I wanted to give you a short background on the book of Haggai. So Haggai speaks into the lives of God's people after their return from Babylon. You'll hopefully have caught on from Habakkuk that God was going to send the Babylonians to punish his people for their rejection of him and send them he did. Many Israelites died and those that survived were forcibly taken to Babylon to live and work and serve the empire. 
But that only lasted 70 years before the Persians conquered Babylon and took a different approach to foreign policy. Indeed, King Cyrus decided to send all the people the Babylonians had taken as exiles back to their own land to live and work. Of course, that's the human politics of it. But behind the scenes of these grand movements of history is the hand of God who spoke of the things that were to come for the kingdom of God in Jeremiah 32 from verse 36. He says, You are saying about this city, by the sword, famine and plague, it will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon. But this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, I will surely gather them from all the lands where I banish them in my furious anger and great wrath. I will bring them back to this place and let them live in safety. They will be my people and I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action so that they will always fear me, that all will then go well for them and for their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them. I will never stop doing good to them and I will inspire them to fear me so that they will never turn away from me. I will rejoice in them doing good and will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and soul. So that's God's plan, and it all plays out in Ezra chapters 1 to 4. In Ezra chapter 1, we hear that the Lord did move in the heart of Cyrus to send the people back to their land, the land promised to Abraham with gifts and resources and authority that they might build the temple and honour God. In Ezra 2, we're told about all the people who return and how generous they themselves were to the rebuilding process, are donating half a tonne of gold and over three tonnes of silver. In Ezra 3, we're told how the work began. They managed to build an altar and sacrifice to God to worship him with all their might. And then they built the foundations for the whole temple. And in the midst of that, they praised God, saying with praise and thanksgiving, They sang to the Lord, Ezra says, He is good. His love towards Israel endures forever. And then the people gave a great shout and praise to the Lord because they saw the foundations of the temple were laid. Ezra chapter 3 verse 11. And then in Ezra 4 and 5, things go pear-shaped. And that's why God sends the prophet Haggai with a word of rebuke and encouragement. So let's listen to Haggai chapter 1 now and see what God has to say to them and to us. Hi there, my name's Daniel and I'm from the 930 Family Church Congregation. I have the pleasure of reading the Bible for you today. We're going to be reading from Haggai chapter 1 from verse 1. Read with me. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of a sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panel houses while this house remains a ruin? Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat but never have enough. You drink but never have your fill. You put on clothes but are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. Go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that I may take pleasure in it and be honoured, says the Lord. You expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty, because of my house which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else 
the ground produces, on people and livestock and on all the labour of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord, their God, and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him. And the people feared the Lord. Then Haggai, the Lord's messenger, gave this message of the Lord to the people. I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, son of Sheltiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of the Lord Almighty, their God. Imagine if you just gave up every time things got hard. How different would your life be? Many of us would not be able to spell or read or write. Uh, we would be hopping from sport to sport and no one would ever get to play more than one round of golf. Uh, the hobbies that preoccupy our Saturday afternoons would no longer fill our garages and your career would probably have taken a very different pathway. But most significant of all, our relationships would be different, wouldn't they? Every family I know has had hard times. Every marriage I know has had some rough patches. Imagine what life would be like if you just gave up every time things got hard. Well, the people Haggai speaks to gave up when things got hard. They stopped serving the kingdom of God and instead served themselves when things got hard. Ezra chapter 4 tells us they gave up. Uh, from verse 4, Ezra writes, Then the peoples around the Israelites, who were meant to be rebuilding their temple, set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. They bribed the officials to work against them and frustrate their plans during the entire reign of King Cyrus of Persia down to the reign of Darius, king of Persia. And after further political machinations, verse 24, uh, the work on the house of God in Jerusalem came to a standstill until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Now, you might argue that it wasn't all their fault. Uh, their enemies came and frustrated their work. They threatened the workers and bribed the Persian officials to work against them and frustrate their plans to build the glorious temple that God had asked them to build. But the reality is, they just chose not to push on. They just chose not to put God's plans first when things got hard. Yes, political pressure was applied and the threats were real, but it is clear from Haggai chapter 1 that the choice was theirs. And they decided it was not time to build the house of the Lord. That is, until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. What changed in that second year? Well, the arrival of of Haggai. And Haggai is straight to the point. Uh, look with me from verse 1 in chapter 1. In the second year of King Darius, on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. This is what the Lord Almighty says. These people say the time has not yet come to rebuild the Lord's house. You see, they made a decision to stop obeying God when things got hard. Haggai knows it and God knows it and he is displeased with them. How do we know that he's displeased from these verses, verse 1 and 2? Well, did you notice the way that God's people are described there? Not as my people, as we expected from Jeremiah chapter 32, but as these people. The people who God promises will be my people have once again become an obstinate people who pursue their own imaginations. At the very point, they should have been seeking the heart of God and walking in the will of God and listening to the word of God. These people don't. And they're rebuked for it. 
Uh, Have a look with me from verse 3. Then the word of the Lord came through the prophet Haggai. Is it a time for you yourselves to be living in your panelled houses while this house remains a ruin? Well, if there's one thing that has fascinated me in coming to St Ives, it's the enormous amount of building work that's going on. Uh, In our street and the surrounding streets, there are knockdown rebuilds, there are second story additions, there are major renovations, there are granny flats going in, and then there's the news of major developments, uh, even over the back fence of the rectory. Everyone appears to be sprucing up their major asset. And that's just what was happening in Jerusalem in Haggai's day. The description of their houses as panelled points to the luxurious nature of their homes. And they're filled with manicured stone bench tops and topiary gardens, underfloor heating and Japanese maple staircases. And meanwhile, the temple foundations are covered in weeds and the Rio is rusted. The money and energy spent on panelling their houses should have been spent on the temple and they're being exposed by Haggai. It looks as though the stress and pressure of the opposition and the busyness of building their own homes has just stopped them from thinking about what they should have been doing. And so Haggai warns them. Look at verse 5. Now this is what the Lord Almighty says. Give careful thought to your ways. You have planted much but harvested little. You eat, but never have enough. You drink, but never have your fill. You put on clothes that are not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. You might have panelled houses, Haggai says, but lift your eyes and see. The harvest is paltry. You're, You're hungry, you're broke, you're cold, you're thirsty, and yet you're putting a pool in the backyard. Again, in verse seven, Haggai urges them to think. This is what the Lord Almighty says, give careful thought to your ways. Even the way God is described here ought to have made their ears tingle. The Lord Almighty is no cursory formula, but rather a declaration of the power and authority, the greatness and might of the Lord over every other power, over Persian kings, over their local oppressors, over the fears and worries they have. And 14 times Haggai invokes this name, the Lord Almighty, as if to say, you feared the wrong person. There's only one Almighty And he is the Lord and you ignored his commands and that is madness. And now this Lord has turned his hand against you again. Uh, Look at verse 9. Haggai says, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. What you brought home, I blew away. Why? declares the Lord Almighty. Because of my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with your own house. Therefore, because of you, the heavens have withheld their dew and the crops of the earth. I called for a drought on the fields and the mountains, on the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and everything else the ground produces on people and livestock and on all the labor of your hands. See, they were rescued and blessed and placed in Jerusalem in fulfillment of the Old Testament promises of the mighty Lord. And then almost immediately, They walk away from the Lord again and so come under his judgment. Why are they cold? The judgment of the Lord. Why is there no rain? The judgment of the Lord. Why is there labour in vain? It's the judgment of the Lord. They gave up on God because things got hard. But now is the time to turn things around and get back to what ought to be their first priority. And so like every prophet before, Haggai calls for change. And it's there in verse eight. I go up into the mountains and bring down timber and build my house so that, it may be, so that I may take pleasure in it and be honored, says the Lord. Haggai says, engage your brain, engage your heart with the kingdom of God because that is what God's people do. And friends, I wonder if you can hear the warning here 
for us. Uh, We on whom the fullness of the promises of the Lord has come. Uh, We who can see more clearly. We who know Christ, who are filled with his spirit. Those who have been rescued, who are living between promise and fulfillment. Can you hear the warning of Haggai? Give careful thought to your ways. And I want to approach this from two angles. First one is this. Are you neglecting the kingdom and the authority of God? Yes, things got dangerous and worry took over. Uh, But ultimately, what they did is forget that the Lord is mighty, their saviour, their conqueror and king. And friends, in life, things will get hard and you will worry and things will take over as well. There'll be a thousand reasons for you to stop listening to God, obeying God, honouring God as almighty and saviour and conqueror and king. And I've seen people do that. Turn their concern for the kingdom of God down because of opposition from family, because of stress and struggle in life and work. Minor on the kingdom because of a preoccupation with their own affairs. I'm sure you've seen people give up when everything has got hard. But that's when you need God most. And when the kingdom of Christ can give you perspective and hope. Don't give up on God or neglect the authority of God when things get hard because he will never give up on you. God could have thrown his hands in the air at the returning people and said, they rejected me again, forget it. But he didn't do that. And that's grace. And God could do the same to you and say, you rejected me again, forget it. But he doesn't. And that's grace. And so Jesus graciously calls us to give careful thought to our ways in Matthew 6, 33. To all who worry and are afraid, who may have neglected God and his kingdom, instead, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Now, we're to seek the things of God as a priority over the things of the world. And does this mean we should neglect the reasonable and daily duties that help sustain our lives? No. But for the Christian, let us engage with God and his work in the world as a priority. Seeking his salvation, living in obedience to him, sharing the good news of the kingdom with others. How do you know if you're truly seeking God's kingdom first? Well, ask yourselves some questions. Where do I primarily spend my energies? Is my time and money spent on goods and activities and experiences that will perish or in the service of God? Am I pursuing a life, the results of which will live on for eternity? Jesus taught us that our focus should be away from this world, its status and lying allurements, and placed on the things of God's kingdom that last So does that describe you and your life? Are you panelling your house, your life, your kids, your hobbies, or are you building the kingdom of God? Worry and the pursuit of wealth are enemies of kingdom concern. And if you're gripped by either, it's time for change. It may be time for you to repent and seek first the kingdom of God. Well, the second question I want us to consider today is, are you listening rightly to the kingdom and authority of God? It's clear, isn't it, that the judgment of God has come upon the people of Haggai's day for not obeying the word of the Lord. They're cold and hungry, thirsty and poor because they've come under the judgment of God. And the natural question many people ask is, when things go wrong for me, is that the judgment of God? Or more pointedly, at this moment in time, is the whole COVID-19 pandemic the judgment of God upon a world that has rejected him? Now, that's a great question, right? (laughs) Well, two things I want to say. First, we can only fully understand the work of God through a revelation from God. That is, we can only know why something is happening when God tells us the why. And in Haggai, it's clear. His people rejected his command and his people were specifically judged as a consequence of what they did. 
And we can see clearly the connection because God reveals the why through the words of Haggai. But without that revelation, we cannot know and we should not assume. So we cannot say COVID-19 has been sent for this reason or another reason because God hasn't told us. So what should we do? Well, Jesus helps us in Luke chapter 13. And here's the second thing. Without a revelation from God as to why, Jesus says the right response is still repentance. In Luke 13, Jesus is made aware of two current events, a massacre and a building collapse. And the people around him assume that the victims of those tragedies have been judged by God for their personal sin. And in pastoral ministry, I've seen the strong temptation to assign sudden unexplainable disasters to the judgment of God in response to some sin. People will say, I must have done something wrong that this has happened to me. But Jesus says, not so fast. It's a mistake to automatically attribute tragedies to God's judgment on people for a specific reason. But rather, here is an opportunity to consider your ways and repent. So when we read of a tragedy in the headlines, we should resist the temptation to assign guilt to the victims as if they or we are receiving God's judgment. But rather, Jesus bids us to look at the sin within us and take the headlines as a warning to repent. So the pandemic is not an occasion for blame, but for self-examination and repentance. Repentance is that change of mind that results in a change of action when things go wrong around us. Rather than assigning causes, we're called to examine our hearts and repent. And I wonder if that is where your mind has gone in the last four months. I wonder if that is where your mind must go as right now you examine your heart. Are you panelling your house, your life, your kids, your hobbies? Or are you building the kingdom of God? Don't waste the pandemic. There are a thousand reasons to stop listening to God in the midst of this season. And perhaps you've done just that. But there is one great reason to turn back to him, and that's Jesus. God has revealed his love for you in Jesus Christ. God has revealed his forgiveness for you in Jesus Christ. God has revealed his compassion towards you in Jesus Christ. And none of that is in question. But this is the thing that is. Do you need to repent? Have you given up because things have got hard? For repentance is not just the way into salvation, it's the way of salvation. Now Haggai called the people of Jerusalem to repent and something remarkable happened, something very few other prophets experienced. And it's here in verse 12. Then Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, Joshua, son of Josadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the Lord. You see what happens there? <laughs> Just 21 days after Haggai opens his mouth, the people get to work building the temple. They actually repented. They actually had a change of mind. They actually had a change of action. And that is repentance. And that's rare for Israel. Friends, this pandemic is calling to you now. Give careful thought to your ways. Haggai is calling to you now. Give careful thought to your ways. The Lord is calling to you now. Give careful thought to your ways. Is repentance rare for you? The Lord's rescued you, but are you walking in obedience to the Lord? I'm going to give you a moment to pray quietly yourself and then an opportunity to repent and turn back to the Lord.
Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have gone our own way and rejected your will for our lives. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you and to please you in every way through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Don't waste the pandemic. Don't ignore Haggai's warning. Seek first the kingdom of God and serve the Lord Almighty only. Amen. Thanks for joining us again. 
If you missed the opportunity to check in earlier in the service, you can do that now. Uh, let us know that you are here and let us know any prep points you might have thought of. If you're a regular member, we rely on your financial support for the gospel work going on here at Christchurch. And we are so thankful for all your generosity. We'd love for you to prayerfully consider starting to support us if you don't already. And you can find details on how to do that on our website. Also on our website, we have a heap of resources, past services, podcasts, and articles that you can access at any time, as well as details on how to get in contact with us. Our Share Life season is now well and truly upon us, and this is a great time for you if you're still interested in learning more about Jesus, or if you have friends who you reckon are keen to hear about Jesus and learn more. You can invite them to join our special three weeks of services in uh, September, uh, and on top of that, we have a series of resources on our website where the staff have gone through and answered a bunch of different questions that people have about Christianity. You can watch them yourself to prepare to answer those questions or maybe send them to a friend so they can hear those answers. Well, what a challenging message we've heard from the start of Haggai to focus on God's kingdom above all else and to not give up when things get hard. The Lord is calling us to give careful thought to our ways and to respond in his great salvation in obedience. See you next week.